I think that quantum physics can make you a good person because, you know, there's a cause and effect, right? So whatever you do, you're going to like what goes around comes around does work in the quantum field world, right? So what I'm saying is that we can actually justify that through science now that, you know, you need to follow, you need to live life with integrity. You can't take responsibility of my action. I can't take responsibility of your action, right? But if everybody, let's say, let's say like that is one of my goals, right? Like, let's say my, if my book becomes a conduit for people to become aware of this binary world, but become aware of how your action is creating your reality. My gift for humanity is that I've written a book, The Quantum Being, and if anybody agrees with what I just shared, they can definitely get a copy from Amazon. Hello, hello, hello. Today, I'm happy to present you amazing after, beautiful woman. She is a rocket scientist. She is an after of quantum being, quantum coach, and a spiritual alchemist. Wow. Never heard before something like this. So... <laughs> Please meet Shikhnaz Sony. Thank you, Dr. Leon, for such a beautiful introduction. Yeah, I, uh, I love that I can converge science and spirituality, and, um, and, and that's why I, I'm here to share exactly that. Yeah, thank you very much, Shikhnaz. And I, I'm really happy you joined my podcast because it was my dream to talk to you after I was reading your book, I even couldn't stop for a couple of days to read this because it was amazing. But I would like uh, to hear from you why people should read your book. What What is something unusual there? The main reason people should read my book so that they can make other channels more accessible to them. Because... I have been running into a lot of people who feel that they are stuck and they're not able to move forward. This book basically shares that how incredible a human craft we are. And when you use the quantum being principle, which pretty much means when you recognize the aspect of your existence that is all continuously changing, then it opens the door for you to embrace the new you in every movement. Wow, very exciting. So this book, for me, it's it's a treasure of wisdom. It's about, this is about life. This is about happiness. This is about suffering. And all these together within one single book. And what I can tell you, that when I was reading, it started from your story from your childhood. And then it's somehow I found myself in a totally different world, in a spiritual world, into in a quantum physics world. And I even didn't recognize this transformation. I never was reading something like this before. And I'd like to ask you about mm -hmm. interesting uh, questions. So you started your book from four very uh, good uh, words, ICPR. Could you tell me more about it? I know. Isn't it interesting? Because, you know, you use a CPR, right, when someone is dying. And every time when my soul died, I use the ICPR. And as an engineer, you know, you use acronym. And it just happens to be the fact that, you know, you know, I for intuitive, right? C for courage, P for perseverance, and R for resilience. And it's interesting because, you know, I had those attributes as my characteristics. Because we all have characteristics, because we all have attributes, we all have strengths, we all have weaknesses, right? 
So if you, it's like if you can recognize a certain attributes that you ha- you carry, then you can leverage that, especially when you're in a situation that's not aligning with your soul, right? So it just so happens that my acronym was ICPR and it makes it easier to convey that I had to resuscitate my soul um, through those attributes that I already have. And, and it's almost like I wanted to master them by going through that journey. Wow. Wow. So let's skip a little bit your childhood and get directly to the your understanding of our world and how you present your understanding and your feeling of your work like engineer and like a spiritual master. So you are NASA engineer. So every day you make design. By the way, uh, I was just, uh, it, it blew my mind when I was reading things like design should have future action embedded into it. Wow. This is amazing. This is what I wrote on my <laughs> on my wall. Because I'm an engineer as well. And so yeah, design should embed future action. Why? Because journey is intertwined with the destiny. Right? So every single thing that we do we are going somewhere, right? It's like a snake and ladder game, right? So either we are going, uh, you know, or, you know, the snake, right, hits you and then you go down and ladder hits you, go up. And it's funny that you play that child game and basically it has all the wisdom encompassed in, in how your action, everyday action, is either adding something in your life or deleting something in your life. And as long as you make a conscious choice, it becomes a very beautiful quantum dance. Uh, for me right now, dwelling into my engineering world keeps me stimulated, keeps me sharp, keeps me on the top because I'm working on a state-of-the-art program. I'm working with the cream of the crops people. We're using all the tools that are one of the most uh, you know, highly sought after tools like model-based system engineering. So it kind of is a good way. It's almost like you know you have to maintain your health, right? You have to make sure that you maintain your health. It's like you have to maintain your mind. And for me right now, that work is kind of maintaining my mind because I would want to retain that because there is a reason I'm where I am today. And I would like to continue growing and continue evolving, right? So how am I going to do that if I don't respect what I have already have and then keep building on top of it? Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. So you, you're talking about life as a pattern. Or as, uh, as a fractal. Uh, what, so how you present life as a fractal? So as I understand, uh, this is why you talk about quantum life. So it's somehow corresponding to the pattern of our life, flowers of life. You're talking a lot about this stuff in your book. And h- how is it possible to to consider our life from quantum point of view, because we are living in a, a mechanical, in a Newtonian world, and how this world just connected to your quantum understanding and your quantum feeling, what to do and how to behave. So when you look at the world from a classical physics perspective, then you feel limitation, you feel things are whatever they are, and it's hard to break the pattern, right? You feel a little bit um, in prison in a way, if I have to really be honest, right? When you look at it from a quantum perspective, then you see that everything is in motion. Every single thing actually is in motion. Earth is continuously moving with respect to the sun and so forth. We are continuously moving because we are standing on Earth, uh, plus, we are at the subatomic level made of quarks and leptons, which is also moving. So if you, and you start looking at it from the quantum physics perspective, it just gives you more freedom and it liberates you from wherever you are so you can actually move forward wherever you want to go, right? So that to me is the only reason I have made this far. If I would have followed the classical physics point of view, 
I would have never been able to get out of my traditional um, future that was given to me, right? By my traditions, by my culture, by my religion, by my family. And I know a lot of people right now, and I look at them, they followed exactly the script that was given to them by their family. And they have a life, and I mean, they have a life that is very different than mine, right? And the type of soul that I was born with, I would have never been content if I would have followed that script. Yeah, right. I agree. So it looks like because we are uh, built out of atoms and all these quantum elements, quantum forces just uh, keep us alive and keep us in this, in our time, space, uh, time, space uh, dimensions. But you know, uh, you know, uh, Donald, uh, Donald uh, uh, physicist Donald Hoffman. He created. He created uh, a agent, conscious agent, notion, conscious agent, and how they connect to each other and how they interfere with each other. You touch this subject in your book. Could you just elaborate more about how we interfere with? each other and how quantum uh, foundation of our uh, being influence on this interference. Right. Because that's why when you use the word like, you know, butterfly effect or ripple effect, all of those are, or hundred monkey effect, right? All of those are highlighting the fact that at the quantum level, we are all interconnected through the quantum field. And therefore, when you talk about the golden rule or law of cause and effect, or even Newton's third law of motion, all of those are saying the same thing. So it's almost like, you know, when people, some people need religion, right, to be a good person. Actually, I think that quantum physics can make you a good person because, you know, there's a cause and effect, right? So whatever you do, you're going to, like what goes around, comes around, does work in the quantum field world, right? So what I'm saying is that we can actually uh, justify that through science now that, that you know, you need to follow, uh, you need to live life with integrity because there is that accountability that's a built-in feature that creates that sacred geometry in the form of flower of life, right? When you do everything right, then it looks like beautiful flower of life. When you don't, it doesn't. Yeah, maybe uh, our audience is not aware about what is it, flower or fly. Could you talk about it a little bit more? I would love yeah. to, to hear as well. The flower of life pattern basically kind of is the pattern that has been found in many ancient places, including Egypt. Uh, when you go to Abido's temple in Egypt, which I personally did go, and there is flower of life pattern um, atomically embedded right? So it's not something you can wipe off because it's not done by any kind of material that's something you can remove, which speaks volume that how important that pattern was for them, right? And it's embedded in Abido's temple. You have to go all the way down and you see it. And uh, it's also found in many different uh, places, like, uh, like all over the world, right? And what it depicts is depicts a pattern of consciousness. So I, you know, anybody who has studied Kabbalah, Kabbalah basically is a study of tree of life, right? Now, the tree of life is actually a subset of flower of life. So I became aware of this whole learning and understanding when I was teaching Kabbalah more than 11 years ago wow. in in my town. And that's when I, because I always like to know like, like a larger perspective. So I wanted to know what is tree of life. And then that's what got me to flower of life because I was wanting to understand that what is beyond tree of life and what flower of life depicts is that, you know, when you exist, so let's say when consciousness exists, it wants to interact. And because it wants to interact, it makes the Venn diagram in math, and you can call it Vesica Pisces in, in, in ancient language. As soon as it overlaps the two circle, what happens is as soon as we interact, like as soon as you and I interact, we have created a dynamic which is called Vesica Pisces. As soon as you create a Vesica Pisces, that dynamic creates another interaction. And then it creates a triangle. And what happens, the flower of life is basically a pattern that 
keeps on multiplying circle by circle and then it ends up getting to the point where it becomes a representation of a seed of life which actually is a depiction of how we come into existence from the from you know in 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 the uh, embryo so there's and then not only that that pattern that the embryo pattern the seed of life pattern and also the binary math which pretty much is used in every aspect of our existence because ultimately everything boils down to zero and one is also following the exact same pattern as flower of life and then that is connected to how you know the ma in math we can represent the exact same thing with fibonacci sequence and then when you take the ratio it becomes the phi ratio so it's very beautiful how flower of life picks up like a chain all of these concepts that people have heard it but they don't know that how they're all connected with the exact same pattern. Yeah, and actually what, what kind of pattern just appears in my mind? If we take the world and we percept this world, and uh, so we make decisions based on this perception, because uh, I'm not, I, I just keep that based on perception, we have some values and we create principles, we create world view, we create... Uh, rules to follow these principles it becomes sometimes become uh, even uh, experience it becomes uh, our uh, habit i just want to skip it so let's think about triangle uh, word perception decision and action back to this world changing this world and if we have many people just interfere each other all these actions become some waves, right? So, what what do you think from quantum point of view, quantum being point of view? How it's possible to to manage to navigate inside this huge information space? So, one of the things that we all have to do is take responsibility of our own action, right? Because you know. You can't take responsibility of my action. I can't take responsibility of your action, right? But if everybody, let's say, let's say like that is one of my goals, right? Like let's say my, if my book becomes a conduit for people to become aware of this binary world, but become aware of how your action is creating your reality, then what happens if you do everything with integrity and with an intention that supports the love or multiplies the love in the world? then what happens is that now you've planted a seed and that's going to grow into love, right? If you do the same, you can use the same principle and multiply fear because you have the power to do both yeah. and you can do that too. And we have already seen that what we see in the world right now is a lot of projection of fear. It's a very fear-based world that we live in. And, and that actually surprises me more than ever because, you know, most of the world is very religious and religion already tells you that there's more to the story than yourself, right? There is a God, there's a powerful being. So then why people get so fearful? Because to me, that makes no sense because, you know, it's it almost, it's contradictory. And I, I'll give you an example, even in my town, you know, when we had this whole uh, pandemic was happening and everybody was so fearful. And my town is very uh, predominantly Christian. So I actually did some public speaking in the middle of Fort House and I made a point that most of you are Christian, which means that you should not be so fearful with the virus. Like, why are you giving virus more power than the God? Right? So it was very interesting because they were like, wow, that's a great question she's asking. And, and so it comes back to that, that we all know that we're all connected. We all know that we can affect each other. So why not we affect each other with love? Because it helps us to be loving. Because when you love someone, you feel good. When you hate someone, you don't feel good. So that to me is a very simple way to gauge your action through your own feeling, through your heart. Yeah, so you have to create the wave of love instead of wave of fear. Exactly. Exactly, because everything multiplies in the universe. So why not multiply something that actually makes, feel, makes you feel good and it also helps other people feel good? Because then it becomes a win-win situation. Do you apply... Do you apply this thinking in your everyday job in NASA? How it looks like to apply this spiritual uh, work and how it does does help you to to manage your real world? 
Yeah, it's very interesting because I like, for example, I went to NASA Kennedy Space Center last week and it was all about talking about multiple element integration tests that we're going to have to perform before we have the woman live on the dark side of the moon, right? So we were talking about how are we going to do that because we have lots of different players, right? We have like, you know, space apps making a starship, then we have a Boeing making a space launch system rocket. Then we have Lockheed Martin making the Orion capsule that astronaut is going to be inside. And we have to make sure everybody talks to everybody and there's no problem doing docking and all that stuff. And it was very interesting how in the meeting there was about 50 people in the room. And there were times because, you know, there were focals for Orion, focals for, you know, um, SpaceX. And there were times they were kind of like arguing with each other or getting mad at each other because somebody didn't say something to each other and all that. And I actually, like, it was not even my place to say anything like that. But because uh, I kind of found an opportunity, like, I would basically say that don't we all want to make sure that we have built the right things? So we are all here to validate what we are building in order to make sure that the mission Artemis III becomes successful. So if, if you all have the same goal, then why not we work together in a way that we can get to that goal. Like we should always keep the goal in mind. So I started giving my speech like I would do in my in any day. And it was very interesting because it was definitely out of place for me to say that because I was not the one leading the meeting. But I could see that everybody was like listening to me. And I'm the only Pakistani girl. I mean, I'm the, you know, there were only like six women and 50 people. So you can just see the demographic, right? It was more yeah. men. And then uh, out of all the women, all of them are white except me, right? So I'm already like an oddball. And plus my accent is so prominent that every time when I speak, people notices me, right? So they're like, and like, they're all like, and it was, it was like, I just said it. I'm like, you know, we all want, don't we all agree that we want to build the right thing? Because that's the definition of validation. And then I'm like, so if you all agree that we want to build the right thing, then what are we fighting for? We need to fight for the same cause, right? So it's good that we are on here and we're finding out all these discrepancies because that's was the whole reason we have this technical interchange meeting. Yeah, I, I, I think we have to, to apply this everywhere. So we have to find... Because always, right, because I see that, you know, we want to live on a moon, but we can't even get along on Earth. So I always kind of, like, I have... So that's how I actually interject at my work is that people are always, like, lost in the, in the you know, among the trees. And I bring the perspective of the forest. I bring the perspective, larger perspective, right? So that's how I usually kind of break that habit. And they can just see that I'm always looking at things from a very different perspective. So I think even in a such level like NASA, people are looking for how to run out something instead of to run to something. And this is... This is just embedded in, into our brain. So instead, as you said, we have to embed future action it's, uh, in our brain, but we actually embedded past actions in our brain and keep it for a, for a whole life. Thank you very much. It was an amazing conversation. Do you have some uh, words to, to, to our audience? Uh, I don't know. You decide what kind of good words you can say to our audience? Well, I would say that we all are doing our best to stay and exist in this world, despite of the challenges of being in this confined body, and despite of the challenges of what's happening in the world at the global level, despite of the fact that we have a lot of personal things that we have to do day to day. Uh, my gift for humanity is that I've written a book, The Quantum Being, and if anybody agrees with what I just shared, they can definitely get a copy uh, from Amazon. And and if they like what I share, because what I'm doing now is that I actually just did my book in my voice in audio. So it's an audible version is also available. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I also am planning on um, kind of offering, you know, little courses here and there as I get a chance. So if people like to learn anything from me, then they can just sign up on my website, which will enable them to get the, you know, an indication whenever I'm teaching at online classes. So those are the ways I'm serving humanity through my book, through my teaching. And whenever I get an opportunity to have a conversation like we just had, because we all have to do our part and 
and show up the best way we can for ourselves and for others. Thank you, Sheikh Nahas. So we we have met with after of Quantum Being book. It's all about life, happiness, and quantum. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Sheikh Nahas. It was amazing meeting you. Thank you very much. Thank you.